I'm very happy to present Professor uh, M.A. Uh, Veronica Rafin. She's a graduate teacher from Philosophy Letras. She graduated as a professor of English, as a professor of English as a foreign language. And after that, she went to the United States and got her master's in education from the University of South Carolina. And after that, and most recently, she holds a postgraduate certificate in teaching English for academic purposes, which is the topic of her presentation today. Uh, this degree she has attained from Sheffield Hallam University, Sheffield, the United Kingdom. All right, so she's a university. She's really cool, okay? <laughs> All right, so Veronica has been teaching for many years and she has experience coordinating groups, managing EFL and EAP programs, like the one we have right here. And above all, she's been teaching English language learners in Argentina, in the USA, Kurdistan, and the UK. She's worked in higher education institutions, uh, institutions since the beginning of her teaching career. At the beginning of her career here in the English department, she taught phonetics and phonology with Miss Cordova over here. And uh, she has taught English for academic purposes in pre-sessional courses at Birmingham University, where she currently works. She's given instruction in grammar and language at a number of teaching training colleges and universities, including Kurdish teachers in a teacher training program in Kurdistan. Anything else? No. Okay, so here I leave you with Ms. Veronica Rafi. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good. Thank you for coming, first of all, and thank you for having me. Um, when I talked to Celia about EAP, something that I didn't know about when I was studying here and I didn't know about when I was working here um, or in Buenos Aires and or in the States, I didn't know in, uh, about um, EAP until very, very late, perhaps. So that's why I thought it would be interesting to know a little bit more about EAP and, and to, to share what I know about EAP. And, um, and EAP is English for Academic Purposes. And, um, and I know that you know a little bit, or you might know a lot about ESP. Jorge, you were talking about EAP, uh, ESP before. So there are many acronyms that people use in English, right? A lot of acronyms. And I hate them all, hello. I hate them all. Um, because in my head, I always have to spell them out. I cannot just say ESP, I have to say ESP, and in my head, I have to go English for specific purposes. I cannot process them for some reason. But anyway, um, I thought that we could start today with just a little bit of acronyms. So, um, are you ready to play? Can you talk to the person sitting next to you and see if you can identify these? If you can't identify them, just guess, all right? Can you do that? So to talk to the person sitting next to you and see if you know all of these. I think you, you got it. 
Yeah. So EAP is English for Academic Purposes, mm -hmm. and then within EAP you have EGAP, which is English for General Academic Purposes, mm -hmm. and then you have ESAP <laughs> for Specific Academic Purposes. So you have so branches. We are branches. We are branches. And I was going to do a whole thing with branches, but then I didn't know because there's a lot of um, yeah intersections and. and Lots of things are that overlap. But this is, these are the ones that you had in the previous slide, right? These are the different ones. So these are all the children and grandchildren of um, English language teaching, right? All of them. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't remember learning about um, ELF or ELF. I don't remember learning about that one, and then when, it, when I read Thinking Lingua Franca, it was like, eh. So as a Lingua Franca would be, if you are doing, for example, if you have um, businesses in China, and businesses in Germany, and businesses, they need English as a Lingua Franca to be able to communicate and to be able to interact. Yeah. English as an international language. English as an international language. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. English as an international language. So there are many more, there are many more, and you will see one of the slides later on, there's another one that appeared, but I was too lazy to go back and change the word uh, cloud, so I left it at that. But there are many, many different ones, and there are more, there are more, and you will have, um, and there is, there is a lot of overlapping, okay? When you were talking about ESP and, e, and, um, and ESAP, there's a lot of overlapping, okay? So, don't feel that, that these are the only ones and that you have to know them all because the truth is that you will start learning about them if you need them, yeah. right? But I think that all of us are within the first one. So all of us started teaching within ELT in different contexts. And we would teach, I would teach here in the morning and it was one focus. When, when, you would, when I was teaching phonetics, it was one focus. And then I would teach at an English school and it would be a different focus. Not only because of the age of children or, or the learners, but you know, but because of um, of the audience and what they need. Okay, so this is going to be the focus today. We're going to wait for a little bit. No, there are places here. There are a few chairs here if you want. And I'm not going to ask the questions. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> All right, so this is the purpose of the talk today, and this is how I've organized it. So I'm going to talk about the why and the what. So why is it that we wanted to talk about EAP? What is it that EAP is? And the context. So in the context, I split it up in context, people and content, but all of that is the context, really. So the content, the people, who is it that we are teaching and who the teachers are. Um, and then we we'll have time at the end for Q&A, for questions and answers. So to begin with, the why. And I think I started the, you know, I started the, the, the talk today by saying I didn't know about EAP until I applied for a job in EAP. And then I had to do all the research. I was desperately looking for a job. And I knew I needed to move countries, and I knew I had to leave, and, and, uh, and I started looking for opportunities in universities in England. And most of the posts I could find, because there are lots of job opportunities, there are many, many, many job opportunities in that area, was in EAP. So I started doing the research about EAP, and then I heard another acronym, IELTS. Have you ever heard of IELTS? Yes. Oh, you are much better than I was, because <laughs> I had no idea what it was. I knew about TOEFL. Uh, but what is it, please? IELTS is an exam. It's like TOEFL. Ah. And you know how students need to do the TOEFL to start English at universities in the States? In, ah, that is in, 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 yeah, in Europe and in England especially, you need IELTS. Okay, so it's another exam. Um, all right. So the other thing is, when you want to make the transition, when you want to, do you want to come in? There are a few places here. There are three seats here, two here, three here.
But when it says cultural, it doesn't refer to the culture of the country. It doesn't refer to culture in general. It is culture in an institutional and discipline-specific area. So it is a culture within that context. What is it that you would do in engineering? What is it that you, that you would do in biosciences? What is it that you would do in languages? Right? So in that specific context. And then the teaching content explicitly matched to the language practices and study needs of the learners. So you cannot bring anything to the table. You cannot bring any text to the classroom. It has to be a text that is related to their studies. Even if it is loosely related, because do you remember the difference between EGAP and ESAP that we talked about at the beginning? Yes. So with general academic purposes, with general academic purposes, you could bring more generic texts. It could be something about research, for example, you know, or when you talk about plagiarism or how to avoid plagiarism or how to do citations. Um, because all of these students are going to be doing um, either bachelor degrees, postgraduate degrees, masters, PhDs, and for those, they will need to read and they will need to put on paper whatever they have been reading together with their own ideas, thoughts, and all of that. So they need to know about plagiarism, they need to know how to avoid it, uh, they need to know how to reference, to summarize, to uh, quote, and all of that. So um, it has to do with their needs. So, in terms of the context, there are three things that make up the context. One is the context itself. Um, just because I couldn't find a better word. And then uh, the people and the content, right, that make up this context. All of these um, has been taken from um, a book from Alexander Argent and Spencer. I have, I'm going to send you, when well, you have the PowerPoint, so you can share the PowerPoint later on. And all the sources are there. But these are like big, big names in EAP, and they are from the University of, University of Bristol. So um, if you want to do some research, can do that. Um, in terms of the content, if you think about the syllabus, when you, when we teach ELT, when we teach young students, for example, um, you generally follow a coursework. So you have a coursework and you go with unit one, unit two, three, four, etc. And we generally go, or we used to go, in many cases, following the grammar as well, right? We started, we would start with present simple and then we would move on, right? In EAP it's different, because the students would come to the EAP classroom with knowledge of English, different levels of English, but they don't have, they have a goal that they have to achieve. And that goal has to do, in general, with entry to university. So it has to do with accessing undergraduate courses or postgraduate courses. So they have what they call an entry requirement, and I'm going to explain about the entry requirement in a minute. But they have entry requirements. So basically, you group students together not only based on their level of English, because their levels of English is, might be quite similar, but you group them together based on their entry requirements, because they all need a 6.5 in IELTS to access a business course, for example. Or they need a 7 because they want to access a law course. So depending on the course that they are going to study, you would group them together. And they are all working together to that level of English in the four skills. Okay? Academic, um, listening, speaking, reading and writing. The other thing is the time available. Who started learning English here when they were very, very young? Yeah. I did. Right? So you start learning English when you're very young, you learn English throughout your life, you continue learning English because you never stop. <laughs> um, so it, it is a continuum, right? And the time is not an issue because you finish this year, you will find another book to continue learning next year. Even when they are grown-ups, I mean, if you are teaching English to grown-ups, they will have, I mean, they will be more relaxed about the time frame. Unless they come to you and they say, I want to learn English because I'm traveling next month. <laughs> like my dad, you cannot do that. They cannot learn that fast. But anyway, um, so the time available is different as well. Because while in a general ELT class, you would have more time, it would be more flexible, you could do evenings, you could do mornings, you could do this or that. 
six months, two years, 20. Uh, in EAP, it's not flexible. You have a course, and that course has to be done in general before they start their courses. So depending on how much um, or where their level is in that spectrum, you would do, you would do a pre-sessional course, and that pre-sessional course could be very short, could be six weeks, if they are almost at the level they have to be, it could be 20 weeks, it could be 42 weeks, which is a whole academic year, uh, just to get them to the level where they have to be. Um, and I'm going to mention in session of courses in, in, in a minute. What is at stake for the student? For many students when learning English, they want to learn English because they want to be better, they want to have better job opportunities, um, it's for, because they have a personal interest perhaps, but in the case of EAP, it's because they want to access that course at university, which means that if they don't pass that pre-sessional course, they cannot study. They have a conditional offer at the university. So the university would say, yes, we accept you here at the university, we want you to study here, but you need to pass your English course first. And if they don't, they have to go back to their countries. So the implications are huge, not only in terms of time, but only in terms of money. Um, so I've been mentioning a couple of things there. I've been talking about entry requirements. And one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning was IELTS. So IELTS is, that's a horrible slide. I wouldn't allow my students to use either. But on the right, do you see that red column there? That is the IELTS, okay? If you look at the top, in the grayish area, there's a nine. So nine would be a native speaker level, right? And that is equivalent to a proficiency. You know about proficiency, yes. Yes. Um, the profi I forgot the name, advanced, so we have the child, the advanced, the first certificate, and all of those tests. So a nine would be equivalent to a proficiency test. But if you want to apply for a university, and you say, I have a proficiency, they will not accept it. You have to do IELTS. And they will check your level against IELTS, and then you will be able to access your birth. Um, the other thing, do you see the letters here, on the right and the left? So the C2, B2, C1, all of those. Those are the CEPHER. Common European frame Excellent. So the, the Common European Reference, um, reference Framework. So that framework is what they use whenever they are talking about, in, and this is used in Europe, not only in, in England, but when they talk about the level of English, you need, you need at least a B2 to get a student visa, for example. So students who are below that B2 level cannot access a visa for England, for example. So these are things, the C2 levels, B1, I might have heard about them, I didn't know what they were, and I still, in my head, I always have to go, okay, A1, A2, A3, until I remember how is it that they are similar to IELTS. So in most of the cases, at university, in the red area, there's for IELTS, they would ask to study in a bachelor course, for example, a bachelor degree. You would need, for some courses, a 5.5 in IELTS. Mm -hmm. All right, it's 5.5, which is within the B2 anyway. Yeah. And depending on the course, you would need a higher level in IELTS or a lower level in IELTS. Um, for business, for example, and I, I keep saying business because many students in our department go for business, uh, they need a 6.5. But this year, because they had many, many students, they raised it to a 7. Right? And there are other departments, um, perhaps where language is not that useful, Someone might say, you might need a 5.5. For example, engineering students need a 5.5. Math students need a 5.5. And for some reason that I don't understand, but I have my theory, philosophy students. So what do you think? Why do you think that happens? They need German. Yeah. yeah. Because I think it, it's a language where, you, I mean, it, you need the language in philosophy, right? I think it is because they don't have many students. <laughs> so for me, it's, yeah, honestly, that's my, okay. But law, if you want to 
study law, they need a 7 or a 7.5. And again, if you're going to study a bachelor's course or a postgraduate course, you need more for a postgraduate course than you need for a bachelor's. Because you have to use the language in a different way. You have to produce written work. You have to do research. So um, we need a higher level of IELTS. So those, that is the, the difference between IELTS and the CEPHER and the different um, exams that you might be more familiar with. Again, if you just Google any of these things, you can Google, right? So just Google IELTS and Cambridge exams and things like that and you will find them. Um, these are the different courses that we use at the university and these are all from the University of Birmingham. So again, you can go into the website and take a look. You have three sessional courses, and I was telling you about the length of the courses, how it depends on your level of English. In sessional support, so yeah, the students get in, the fact that they get a 6.5 and they are in doesn't mean that they are okay forever, because they will need to continue learning and continue improving their English, writing skills, reading skills, and all that. So we offer in sessional support. So in sessional means they are studying their course, and on the side, they have a few hours here and there. With pre-sessional, I forgot to say, do you remember when we were talking about the time allotted for this? A pre-sessional course is a full-time course. Students have 20 hours a week of lessons and 20 hours a week for independent study. So it is a full-time course. Yeah, it's only 20 weeks, but full-time. While in sessional, because they are already doing their own courses, it's additional. Okay, <coughs> so it could be as they have a deeper in Yes, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's like cyclo de like de iniciación was for us, where we had lessons every morning mm -hmm. with Sylvia and <laughs> every morning um, during the week. So it is something like that. Um, and then there is something else that I learned when I was working there, which is foundation, foundation year. The foundation year, if you have students who are coming from different parts of the world, um, you know how to access university in England, you need to have A-levels, you need to do your, your A-levels in order to start university. If you are coming from Escuela Normal, you don't have your A-levels, right? You have your certificate saying that you have finished secondary school. So if you want to start studying there, you have to, you can, if you get accepted, but you have to do a foundation year. And that foundation year is a year in which they will give you additional subjects in the area of study that you're going to, that you're going to study in, um, in addition to English. So you have English and subject specific modules, and you have to pass those in order to be able to start. Um, so th these are the type of courses in which you will have EAP courses. And each university, not each university, but several universities will have a different variety of these. Some universities, these are the courses, for example, the pre-sessional courses, 20 week, 15 week, 10 week, 6. These are the ones that we have at, at my university. But perhaps Bristol offers a 12 week course and an 8 week course. You know, and, um, and perhaps they don't offer it sessional, but they offer more ESAP within foundation than we do, than we do, and things like that. So things might change a little bit. Any questions so far regarding this? No? Okay. All right. So when I was talking about um, the context, I said, well, the other thing is the people. And um, in terms of the people, you have the students, and the students have, when you, when you get your students, right, in class, they might <coughs> want to study English or not, right? You have some students who are studying English because if you're teaching ESP, you might have some students who are doing it because it is part of the curriculum, right? It's part of their program and they have to do it and they hate English and they will tell you that they hate English, right, but they have to study. You might be studying, or you might be teaching at an English um, school, and you have students there who are being sent there by their parents, right? In EAP, I think the level of um, interest is higher. Not because they like English necessarily, but because they need to pass. You know, 
they need to pass to do what they want to do. Right? So, um, so that's, that's uh, the main thing about motivation. So generally, you don't have students who miss lessons, who don't do homework. So they are really, really motivated because they are paying a lot of money to do that course so that they can access university. Okay? If there are issues, and there are issues, it has to do with, with other things, you know, physical illness or mental health issues or life in general, but not necessarily because they just don't want to do it. Um, in terms of the teachers, when you talk about general ELT, I think in general, and, and you see that in many places, if you have someone who has studied or who is a native speaker of English, right? A native speaker of English going to another country, they would often find a job teaching English. And they might have no qualifications in English, they might not be teachers of English, they might have studied psychology, and after that they taught English in Kenya, you know, uh, for a couple of years. And that happens. So in ELT you have this diversity of backgrounds, while in EAD uh, you also have that diversity, but it could be more related to what they have studied. So you have engineers or former students of a PhD in engineering who do an additional certification like CELTA and they teach in EAP. They don't teach students who are going to study philosophy, but they do teach students who are going to study engineering. And they are very good at doing that because they have the knowledge of that field, so they know how to write a report, they know how to do, how you would find research in that area, what journals you would look for, what, which ones are reliable, which ones are not reliable. You know, all of that information um, you can bring to the class. And then what I was talking about at the beginning, about the, the equality or inequality in teacher, teacher and learner and, and ELT, and the fact that when you are a teacher in, T in ELT, generally you are the one who has the knowledge and your students are the novices learning the language, while in EAP you work together, okay? And I'm going to do a little bit of self-advertising here, but um, a colleague and I put together we presented at the conference once, and, um, and we started thinking, we were at the time, um, my colleague Rina and I were, talk we were teaching in a foundation program, so we were teaching EAP in the foundation program. And we thought, well, the thing about EAP is that we basically work in collaboration, you work together. So we called um, this the uh, specialist, specialist approach, because you are working with students who are studying engineering, Right, and you are working with a text on engineering, but basically they are the specialists in that area, and you are the specialists in the linguistics area, right, English area. So you sit down together and work together, and basically, as a teacher, you would propose something, you would inform something. The student will then adjust their learning because of what you have taught, but they will bring in something new and they will guide your teaching, and then you will adjust your learning on the other, your teaching on the other side, and it is like a cycle, right? So it is this cycle that makes sense in EAP, that you work together. All right. Now, just because I need some water, and I think you're going to fall asleep, I, I have included a, a series of questions, of sentences here. So you have seven sentences. Can you decide which ones are more ELT related and which ones are more EAP related? So if you can talk to your partner about these and make a decision, and then we will discuss in a few minutes. Is that okay? Can I give you only two minutes? Yeah.
you think? Was it difficult? Was it easy to do? Kind of okay? Shall we take a look? So they are dense in many cases. Um, sometimes you would, um, they are not in, in relation to number five, they are not that easily accessible um, tech kind of text. You know? they, they might be a little bit more difficult to read, more dense to read. You will never read them from beginning to end though. You will never use that in class because in, in that case, you are not looking at, you are not doing reading comprehension that much, right? If you are working with a long text, if you are working with an, with an article, with an academic article, what you would be looking at is features of the text more than the text itself. And one of the reasons, I mean, as a, as a teacher of English, I wouldn't be able to answer some of the questions, comprehension questions, very easily if I am reading a text in, in, in the area of biosciences. Um, for me, that was one of the most difficult lessons to teach because I was looking at it and going, okay, blah, 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 blah. It was, it was like a different language. Um, but what you do is you look at, at the characteristics of the text. You show them what an abstract is, why is it that they need to read the abstracts, why are abstracts important, and the fact that they can read the abstract and then decide if they want to read the text, you know, just by reading the abstract, um, or looking at the conclusion and then deciding from the conclusion whether they want to read the whole thing or they might need to read parts of it. Or if you are teaching um, something about hedging, for example, hedging, like, um, what is hedging? Like cautious language, right? You don't say everybody likes chocolate, but you say some people might like chocolate, right? So hedging your language and hedging the things that you say. You can look at a conclusion, right? And look at the hedging words and hedging structures here and point that out to students. So you are not going to read the whole text and try to understand it. Um, and do reading comprehension with them. But it's not something that you would do in the EAP classroom on a regular basis. You will be working with the features of that text, the language used. Are they, are they using passive voice? Why are they using passive voice in the text? And things like that. What are the characteristics of um, signposting, for example? How do they use signposting within the, the, the academic article, for example? And then you will also relate that to lectures. Does the lecturer use signposting in the lecture? What kind of signposting? How do they address the audience? How is a lecture different from a text, right? A written text in that case. So that kind of thing is the kind of thing that you will be pointing out in an EAP class. Um, speaking and listening, I think when you are teaching in ELT, most of us would use mainly listening and speaking. We want our students to interact. The focus in EAP is mainly reading and writing. So you use the listening and speaking skills, of course, and you have to focus on them. But I think reading and writing is generally um, more important, right? Because of the activities that they are going to be doing once they start their courses. Um, clarity and objectivity. Generally, in ELT, you would talk about, or you would ask your students to write about what they did during the weekend. What, how they felt about this or that, where, is, where do they want to go on holidays. So you talk about personal things. 
while in EAP the focus would be about the research that they have read. About, so, and you would tell them, you don't write I in your essays, because this is academic writing. You don't write you in your essays, because it is academic writing. Um, so that kind of thing. You don't use con contractions in your essay, because it is academic writing. So that kind of thing. Um, in terms of text and task, or oh, number four, we talked about that. So you would try to bring texts that are from that area of study. Right, so the, and it doesn't have to be very specific. It could be that you have students from um, going to an engineering course and you bring a text in engineering. It doesn't have to be mechanical engineering for mechanical engineering students. It could be a little bit broader. Um, we talked about the genres. Um, variety and pace of activities are important in the delivery. And this is a tricky one because it says ELT there. So it is language teaching. So you as a teacher would bring different activities to get students engaged. That is part of being a good teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And if you are a good teacher in ELT, you will do something similar in ELT. Mm -hmm. So even though it says ELT, it's something that you would do in both, mm -hmm. right? The thing is that your students wouldn't expect games as much. And if you are going to be adding games to your lesson, if you are going to do gamification of the learning and all of that, if you do that, you have to explain a thousand times why you are doing that, you know, and the value of it in that lesson. Because <coughs> in their minds, they will be thinking, I paid thousands of dollars or pounds to be here, and you are making me play and run around the classroom looking for posters and things. No. So, you have to explain. But a good teacher would add that to the classroom, even if they are working with a very boring and long and dense text. Um, and then number seven, this emphasis on study and cognitive skills that you see very little of in ELT, you will see a lot of in EAP. And in fact, some of our classes are just skills, so academic skills, and you have time management skills, because these are students who have moved from their own country, living sometimes with mom and dad, to living on their own, first year at university in a different country and sometimes they would say I don't have time to do homework because I have to cook mm -hmm. you know or to do laundry and things like that so it's teaching them about time management skills um, academic skills in general how to summarize how to take notes how to organize their notes and things like that so um, cognitive skills study skills are very very important and something that is very important that we also focus on is critical skills. Because in many countries, so yeah, they are all studying in the UK, and in the UK one of the main things is that they need to be critical. They need to explain who. They need to explain, um, they need to be critical. They need to use critical thinking. And sometimes students from China, for example, are very used to rote learning, where they would memorize something and they would repeat the information that they have memorized. And that doesn't work. So unless they start thinking more critically and showing that in their work and questioning the teachers and questioning the authors that they read about, um, they won't be able to, to do well at university. Okay. So um, this is an activity that we are not going to do. But it was basically just to show you that you can do, these are the inputs that you would get in a course, that students would get in a course. Students would get lectures, they would get a lot of reading, case studies, presentations. So this is in a general master's course, right? So what you would do as an EAP teacher is try to tap notes <laughs> for your lessons. So you are not following a book, although there are many books now that are EAP focused, but they are very, very, very general. So if you want to do, um, if you want to do something that is specific for your students, you have to use this as the basis of your coursework or your course, and then exploit all the linguistic features and text features of those mm -hmm. um, things. So just to summarize, so this was just if we had time, but we don't. Um, so to summarize, we talked about the context of EAP, we talked about the people in EAP and the content in EAP. And for me, the, the, and when we talked and when Cecilia and I talked about this, the main thing is to make you aware that there is a world out there that does EAP 
And in that world, you don't have to be a native speaker, right, um, to teach. And with our degree from the university, from the Universidad de Tucumán, you can access, you can teach in those courses. And they are taught not only in England, but throughout the United Kingdom, but also in Ireland, in the rest of Europe. There are many universities nowadays in Europe, and I know specifically in the Netherlands, for example, where most of the courses are in English, and they have huge departments doing EAP. So if you are looking for job opportunities once you graduate, this would be a job opportunity. Try to start learning about all of this now, um, and try to start looking outside, looking out and seeing what opportunities there are. So, in the, that, that is the end of my presentation. I have included references that you will be able to look for and to look at later on. And I have included a, a few links for you to explore. This is information where you can find um, lots of different things. So the first one is a link to my university, to my department at the university. I work for the BIA, the Birmingham International Academy, which is a department that teaches EAP to international students within the University of Birmingham. Uh, the second one is BALI, that is the organization for EAP teachers, it's a British association, and I, am, I told you at the beginning I am awful with acronyms, but um, all the jobs in EAP that all the universities in England have will be advertised in that website. So that's a good one to look at. And they have webinars, they have conferences, they have online courses and lots of things. The next one, the Reading um, link, is University of Reading, and they have a magazine called Inform, which is a journal, an academic journal, on um, EAP in foundation programs. That is, do you remember I told you about the research I did with my colleague? That was their journal. They do conferences and then they print their own journals after that. Uh, the other two, no, the, yeah, the other two, uh, links that I added there because I think they will be useful for you as students really. Uh, the phrase bank is something that we always show our students. It's a phrase bank with lots of different phrases that you can use in your writing. And uh, you would use them for, to, for signaling, you would use them for hedging, you would use them for conclusions and they are all grouped in a very nice, nice way. Um, so something for you to look at. But that is part of EAP in the sense that that is something that we have, these are tools that we have to give our students. And it is not plagiarism using them, because these are widely used phrases. The same with the academic word list that you have there as well. So, that's it, that's question and answer, and I've managed, I think, almost to, to do it. That's all, so it's time for Q&A. Um, I don't know how you want to organize this. Is it open? Yes, yes. Yep. So, yes, any questions? Jorge. Um, how is that you organize the careers in each course? For example, the engineering. Mm. Do you have a course for all engineering students? Or do you divide it according to the career? Or what? We have um, what we have. So, we have different courses, right? The foundation year is a year, an academic year. Mm -hmm. And in that, what we do is we have students, we organize them in two, diff in two groups or three groups. One is, two groups, one is engineering and, and um, sciences, like the hard sciences, and the other one is humanities. But they have, and they have, so it's very, very broad in that sense. And those are the EAP lessons that we do with those. And then they have the specific subject, specific modules based on the careers that they are going to study. In the summer, in the summer we have a huge pre-sessional program which starts now. They are having they are having teacher induction tomorrow, the day after. Um, and we have a huge summer program. And in the sub, a huge like we had before the pandemic, the the, um, the year before the pandemic, we had 1,800 students, and we would hire 160 teachers for that program. So we are like a very small department. And then we go like this for the summer, and then we go back to this. So uh, in that case, we would group students based on subjects. So we would have very small groups. It's groups of 15 students in each class. And, um, and generally, we would have all the engineering students together, all the 
um, I don't know, law students together, business, we have several courses with business students. And then you have the one who is studying molecular engineering and uh, astronomy engineering or whatever, and they are put together because they have very few things in common. Yeah. But generally, we organize them like that. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, as a teacher, you mean? Yes. You don't need to have a background. It is great if you have a background. So, if my husband, who is an engineer, wants to do that, he could do the teaching course, which is shorter, and teach. And I think he would be very better prepared to teach engineering students than I am, right? But it doesn't mean that you cannot do it. Because what you will be looking at is not uh, how it works, um, how the processes work and stuff, but you are going to be looking at how the lectures are organized, how the texts are organized, how the reading is organized. And you will be teaching those kind of skills to those students. What to look for, that is what you are teaching. What to look for, what to pay attention to. And then with the student, in collaboration with the student, they will guide you, you know, in terms of this is what it means, this is what they are talking about, you know. Which for them is also good because by explaining, they are learning, so it is, it is a two-way thing. I think at the beginning when I was teaching, when I was teaching foundation, because foundation students are just starting at university, the level is lower, so you are looking for specific texts in specific genre, but they are not very, very high level, you know? They are a little bit, they are like abridged versions, you know, of um, the texts. What I found, I didn't find that very difficult, but when I started teaching in sessional, and I had a lesson with biosciences students, and a lesson with engineering, and a lesson with, I found that more challenging. But it is once you understand that you are not going to be the expert in those areas, you are never going to be the expert in those areas, it becomes easier because you set up the expectations as well. You tell the students, I know nothing about engineering. But what I can see is that in this abstract, in this text, you're going to read about this, this, and that. Is this what you need? No, what I need is something else, so you don't need this text. So these are the features that you need to look for. Does it make sense? Yeah, okay. Any other questions? And yep. do you? Oh, sorry. It's not today. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, in our case, uh, we are studying here to be teachers. Mm -hmm. You can access these jobs with your with your degree from the university. You can access these jobs. Um, I think that the main the main problem is more of a, um, has an immigration aspect, you know. So because these courses are so short, people will not sponsor universities will not sponsor you to go and teach. If you happen to have, for example, unless it is a permanent post, you know, a very high end post. In those cases, yes. If you have a PhD, yes, you can apply for those because universities will sponsor teachers at that level, you know, to do research and teach. But um, if what you're looking for is for EAP courses, because they are so short, they will not do sponsorships. So um, before Brexit, before England came out, or the United Kingdom came out of the European Union, before that, anyone with a European passport would be able to go and apply for a job like anyone here, you know, um, without any issues. Now, after Brexit, you can still do that in Europe, universities in Europe, and you can still do that in universities in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, because it belongs to, even though it is closer to the United Kingdom, it belongs to the European Union. In England, you won't be able to do it in the same way. It is not as easy as it was, be as it was before. Does that make sense? Yeah, was that your, your question? Yes. Yeah? Okay, good. Yes? My, my question was is if you get texts from students, because that's the way I work with them here, because yeah. they are so specific that, that yeah. I cannot, I, I ask them to provide material. Do you work like that? You can do it, you can do it. At the moment, I, I used to do that with the sessional, because we had a course prepared, 
but then there was a course that we were offering where we had very, very few students interested in that particular course. So for me, it was easier to say, okay, I have all of these prepared, but it's the three of you, so I can um, okay. basically tailor it. So they would bring the materials, and they yes, would the work question with them. is when yeah. they are too many. You can do students. that. You yes. can do that. But if you want to prepare, because you don't want to do something that will be good for you today and not next year, mm -hmm. you know, you want to do something that you can start Reuse. building on mm -hmm. exactly. So if you bring something, if you start providing texts that are a little bit more general, okay. you know, to engineering students, then you will be able to start collating and, and getting okay. your. Um, database yes. and your, yes, yes. your materials you know, you. and eventually you will be able to put them together in a course book that you can use with engineering students for example um, and you can do that by looking for journals so if you go do you know about Google Scholar yes so you use that here so if you go to Google Scholar you can find articles in those areas that you're looking for and, and then start putting together things it's a nice idea to, to think of an own database yeah yeah, okay. Because if not, you will never stop planning, you know, you will always have to, I mean, you plan anyway for every lesson, but I understand you will what never you mean. be able to catch up. I understand yeah. what you mean. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Any other questions? No? All right. Good. Can I ask you, I got it here, um, I was talking to a few people before the session, and um, I some people will have specific questions. So if you have a specific question, I am on LinkedIn, so just search for Veronica Rostin and uh, I'm there, message me and uh, I'm happy to help. But if you need me to put you in touch with someone, I'd be very happy to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also included a, a feedback form. So if you can give some feedback, that would be useful. And perhaps we can do something like a webinar kind of thing, or where I can see who might be able to have expertise that I don't have over there and share with you and vice versa. So we can do something together. So if you give us feedback, um, that would be super useful as well. All right? Good. Mm -hmm. Managed to finish. particularly because we have a lot of prospects worldwide all right so thank you all very very much and we'll be seeing you in class yeah.